This episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast is presented by our new football show, Sports Spectrum's Weekly Slant. Check it out at sportsspectrum.com. It streams every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern on Facebook, on YouTube, and at our website, sportsspectrum.com. It's the only show of its kind out there, football and faith. I dare you to try and find another show that's talking about football and bringing Jesus into the conversation. I haven't been able to find one. That's why we're so excited about Sports Spectrum's weekly slant. We hope you'll check it out. If you're a football fan who loves the Lord, man, check this show out. It streams Wednesday nights live at 8 p.m. Eastern on Facebook, YouTube, and sportspectrum.com. But then you can watch it over the next three or four days as you get ready for a weekend of football, both NFL and college. Sports Spectrum's weekly slant, our brand new football show. Check it out today at sportspectrum.com. Welcome to Sports Spectrum, where we bring Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, former ESPN producer, Jason Romano. And welcome everyone to the show. I am Jason. This is the Sports Spectrum podcast, and we got one powerful conversation coming your way today with Tyler Zombro. Tyler is a pro baseball pitcher who this year reached as high as AAA and pitched with the Durham Bulls, the Tampa Bay Rays minor league AAA affiliate, played his college ball at George Mason, set a bunch of records there as a college baseball pitcher, but went undrafted and didn't really know if his pro career would ever get off and running. And it did. And he went through the minor league system, as many guys do, coming through single A, double A, rookie ball, all of that to get to AAA in 2019. And then again here in 2021, with the Durham Bulls. But it was June 3rd, 2021, just a few months ago, where everything changed for Tyler. He was facing Brent Cumberland of the Norfolk Tides in a game and a shot back to the mound up the middle at over 100 miles per hour hit Zombro in the right side of the head, just above the ear, knocking him unconscious. It's amazing and miraculous that he's able to even do an interview like this. ESPN also did a feature on him back in late August. And the recovery, the trusting in God, the purposeful recognition by Tyler to know that God's got a greater plan here for him, whether he pitches again or not. My goodness, what a story from Tyler Zombro, who grew up with a grandfather who played professional baseball as well and had one of the great nicknames you'll ever hear. Wimpy. Take a listen to Tyler Zombro's story. It's a powerful one. I know it. it's going to encourage you. It's right now on Sports Spectrum. Hey, Tyler, what's up? Welcome to Sports Spectrum. Hey, how's it going? Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. I'm glad that you could join us. Your story, obviously, from the ESPN article and from all that you've went through these past four or five months is incredible. We're going to talk about it, but I want to go back a little bit and start specifically with the nickname that your grandfather had, who I know played pro baseball, um, Melvin Wimpy Zombro. Did I, did I pronounce that right? That's, that's correct. (laughs) Do you call him grandpa Wimpy? Like, what was that like growing Um, up with, uh, with grandpa? (laughs) Well, he, he's hard at hearing. I'll preface with that. Um, (laughs) but I've always called him wimp, wimp or wimpy, uh, I don't know if the words grandpa have (laughs) ever come out of my mouth to him, but uh, growing up on a farm town in uh, Charlestown, West Virginia, actually, I guess his brother's nickname was Popeye and he was Wimpy. And (laughs) I don't know, Wimpy just caught some momentum and that's what he's been called ever since. So Wimpy played baseball in the Philadelphia Athletics organization, right? So that had to be kind of an inspiration for you as you've gone on your journey. Yeah, it certainly has. Um, I mean, he's an incredible individual, honestly, as I know we're going to touch on some faith-based stuff. He, he's a large part of that. Um, my grandmother, his wife passed away when my dad was like 15. Um, I don't think Wemp has ever taken his wedding band off since extremely committed individual. Um, and really a lot of the ethics of life I've learned from him, but he's, he's always pushed me to to be a good person and to certainly make the most of what I can on the baseball field as well. 
Well, let's go there. You said, you know, there was a faith aspect to what you learned from WIMP. Um, tell us about that. Kind of share a little bit about maybe that journey as well. He's a, uh, he's a servant leader. He's a quiet guy. I guess being hard at hearing is probably a part of that. Yeah. But, you know, I, I just watched him and observed him from such a young age with how he carried himself, the relationships he had with specifically his teammates, because he's, he played senior softball until he was 85. So <laughs> if you do a quick Google search of Wimpy, I'm sure a ton of softball stuff will pop up. Um, but just seeing the nature of how he went about his life and his business to take care of. Um, my dad has two sisters. Um, one actually passed away from cancer as well. So similar scenario to what my grandmother's situation would have been. But at the end of the day, seeing how his faith kind of drives him, but not in a vocal manner, again, in some of that servant type of style. And that really sits with me because I think in my journey, I'm not the most vocal about it either, but I found my relationship to grow stronger, oftentimes in silence. What about for you growing up? So you see Wimp, Faith, I have to imagine if, if it's there watching him, that was a big part of your life, I would imagine, right? Going to church and kind of being in this community of people who were worshiping God and kind of following along in the Bible. What was that like kind of growing up for you, your, um, I guess, being presented to this world of faith and going to church and things like that? Yeah, so I, I grew up in a divorced household. So um, I was split 50 50 time wise. Both sides of the family were pretty, uh, pretty consistent with going to church on Sundays. But, you know, ultimately, I, I go through confirmation when I was like 14, I believe. Um, and then when I go to college, I'm not attending regular church services. But honestly, uh, a part of my routine that's really come into play here. And again, I relate this back to Wemp. He he'll go to church every Sunday, but he just has such embedded routines about him to where hmm. oftentimes for me, when I go do work in the mornings, like I have my daily devotional, I'll do reading, I'll think over things. Um, and so embedding that part of my life, I think was, was even more so important, just uh, picking up on what routines he had in his life and how, I can kind of create my own with, of course, the chaotic schedule that I do have. What was it like when you got to college? You went to George Mason. Um, was that a spot for you, a time for you to kind of find yourself and figure out life and this relationship with people and certainly with God? Was that a time for you, an important moment and time frame for you? Yeah, certainly. I think being from a smaller town, um, I mean, if, if we're being technical in like towns, if we're going Stan or Fort Defiance or New Hope, like right. you're just talking a few thousand people, you know? Right. Um, but, you know, getting up near the DC area, diversified culture, learning about different lifestyles, different backgrounds. Um, of course, with just the college scene, there, there are a lot of morals and ethics going on, but, sure. you know, in college, you're able to, at least for me, I'm able to sit back and really observe and, um, ultimately see, you know, which way I really want my life to navigate. Um, and that that's an experience that I'll forever be thankful for. Tell me about baseball. Was that it growing up with, you know, grandpa wimp who played in the Philadelphia athletics organization? I am assuming that was the sport that you gravitated towards at a very young age because you played it in college and obviously professionally, uh, was that the sport as a kid? That was the sport with basketball mixed in. Okay. Uh, my dad played in college. My grandfather, my mom's side played. Um, my mom was a basketball and volleyball player. Uh, but my dad had a lot of friends who were in pro ball. So at a young age, like I'm going around pro baseball fields, I'm, you know, going to a big league game and meeting a lot of the Pirates players, Mike Williams, who was a closer there, an all-star at one point in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Um, I, I would just always was navigated towards the game. I knew it was the sport, but I guess I dabbled in basketball to keep me honest. So <laughs> who were, who were the posters on your wall as a kid? Like if you dabbled in basketball, I'm guessing it wasn't just baseball. It might've been basketball as well. Who were the guys that you kind of worshiped or looked at and said, those were my guys. Um, I mean, at a really young age, at that point in time, Mike Williams and, Billy Wagner were big ones, but uh, mm -hmm. I was a huge Roy Holiday fan. Yeah. Um, you know, I think just watching the style at which he pitched, 
uh, was intriguing to me. So uh, th- those were the big ones. Other than that, I mean, I got to be honest, I just I just loved all players that were good at that point in time yeah. uh, and just kind of followed with them. Yeah, I mean, Halliday was so good and so unique, also quiet. You know, he wasn't, you know, a guy who was boisterous or screaming and yelling or top of the line in the media. And obviously, rest in peace, Roy Holiday, for that accident and everything and losing him at such a young age. But what a pitcher he was. And it's, it's interest, interesting to say that word now because there's a lot of throwers and there's a lot of guys who throw, you know, high speeds. But Holiday when I think about his career and there's a few of them still out there now, but he's a, he was a pitcher, right? Is that what was appealing in some ways when you watched him? Yeah, certainly his, just his demeanor and mound presence. So I think that's likely how I am viewed on the mound as well, especially all through college was consistent, very level-headed, not a whole lot of ups and downs for me, very routine oriented and, I, you can just see that with how he operated on the mound, that, that that's definitely the approach he had. So you pitch at George Mason, uh, and Tyler Zombro, our guest here on Sports Spectrum. Tyler, you pitch at George Mason, and you go undrafted uh, coming out of George Mason. Were you thinking at that point that maybe pitching and playing pro ball just might not happen? Uh, kind of take us to that mindset when the draft happens, you know, you don't get selected, and you have this this dream, this desire to continue pitching, but it's just not there right away. Take, take us through what was kind of going on inside Tyler Zombro's mind. Yeah. So junior year, um, I finished that season extremely strong. Um, I, I mean, I had a good freshman, sophomore campaign as well. Um, junior year, the back half was excellent. Uh, my velo had ticked up. Um, I graduated with 30 plus credits out of high school. So actually at that point in time, my junior year of college, I only had like six credits left the next year to graduate. So in talking with scouts, that was one of the things that I frequently brought up is, Hey, I'm ready to start my pro career. I only have two classes left essentially to graduate. Um, And of course I'm not asking for high dollars either. I just want to get in pro ball and see what I can make out of it. Sure. Um, You know, I heard a lot from a few teams. I thought that there was actually a deal in place on day three of the draft junior year. Nothing came about. You know, it was fine. I accepted it. I moved on. I had seen plenty of guys who were senior signs the next year. And, you know, in those top 10 rounds, generally rounds like seven to 10, you see a lot of seniors taken to save money for the allotted slot bonuses. Of course, in later rounds, seniors fly off the board. And at that point in time, you know, I'm like, well, I'm I'm Mason's all-time innings leader. I'm first in this category, that category. Like, there's no way that I don't get a chance at pro ball. And, you know, Mason has produced quite a few big leaguers. Um, you know, Sean Camp was a long-tenured guy, Mike Colangelo, Justin Bohr. So it wasn't – I didn't feel like I was coming from a tiny school where results wouldn't be valued at all. Right. Um, so I was just like, you know, like something's going to happen. I kind of, I felt like it was, um, as draft day went by and each pick went by, uh, started to, you know, be like, okay, when, when's this going to happen? And ultimately when it didn't, um, I think it was shock at first. And then unfortunately the nature of baseball, it, it led my mind to a lot of comparisons Mm-hmm. Um, why, why is this guy taking over me? How could they possibly think he's a better pitcher than I? Um, and those, those thoughts ran for quite a while. Um, and so after that happened, I didn't hear anything a few days after the draft in terms of free agent signing. Then I said, okay, well, you know, I, at this point I've been dating my now wife for, I guess, five years or so, six years. I mean, we started dating sophomore year of high school. So mm. I guess six to seven years. Um, I was like, I'm not going to play independent ball, had coaching opportunities, could go to physical therapy school. I had plenty of options, but it was like, I still needed to be in the game of baseball. Um, yeah. So accepted that position at R and D baseball in the DC area there to start working. You said you needed to be in baseball. Why, why did you need to be in baseball? I think because of, of my routine, orientation of, of just life in general, like ac- academics always came fairly easy to me, but 
the passion of the process of getting better at baseball is just something that I'm in love with. So in doing that, I, I needed that element of the game to have that process. And I think I've found that in multiple other areas of life, but baseball specifically is where I feel comfortable with that. So, you know, I felt like I was still going to be in the game to some extent. So I kind of want to fast forward a little bit as much as I hate doing it because there's so much to the minor league grind that, and we've had a lot of guys on who, who have been in the minors, who were still in the minors and some who've gotten to the big leagues who will tell us about that grind in the minor leagues, which is the best word to describe it, I think, because it's not pretty, it's not glamorous and it's guys working their butts and working their tails every single day to achieve a dream that for many doesn't ever happen. Um, you get that opportunity. You sign with the Rays, you come through their system, you go all the way to AAA in 2019, didn't pitch last year, which we talked about because of COVID shutdowns before we started a recording. We were kind of going through your journey a little bit, but then this year. So that's kind of where I'm fast forwarding to. And you can go back a little bit beforehand if you want, but kind of coming to this year, 2021, you're back in AAA, you're one step away from the big leagues, from a team that was just in the World Series last year. And once again, this year is going to be in the playoffs and hopefully make a run. Take me to your mindset as a pitcher before June 3rd, because June 3rd is the day, obviously, of the accident. And we'll talk about that too. But take me kind of how things were going leading up to everything that took place June 3rd. Yeah, so 2020 was hard. Um, coming off of being named reliever of the year in 2019, I had a very strong season between AA and AAA. I fully anticipated going to the alternate site in 2020. It didn't happen. 2021, I actually wasn't placed in the alternate site when that occurred either. I was in minor league camp. So, I mean, I was I was pretty nervous. Am I going to double A? Am I going to triple A? Kind of what's going to happen here? And I think a, a common theme of just my pro career is I often need to make sure I'm in perspective of life. Mm, yeah. Um, and I think when I went to AAA leading up to that injury, I mean, we, we have an incredible roster. Um, you, I mean, it's honestly, I would venture to say it's, it's better than the bottom, you know, fourth or fifth of major league baseball. Um, right. You, you know, Wander, Wander's here to start the year. Walls is here. Bruhan, Josh Lowe, Shane Boz, Dalton Kelly, who, has like 27 homers, um, you know, Mike Ford, who's been big leagues with the Yankees for forever. Um, I mean, I think nearly every arm had major league experience. I mean, it was, it was incredible. And at that point, you know, I'm just thankful for the opportunity. Like I'm, I'm surrounding myself. I'm with all major league talent, uh, really good clubhouse. I can't say enough about the character in that clubhouse. So at that point in time in the season, like I'm just being grateful for where my feet are because I'm, you know, I'm sitting here in a bullpen with Adam Conley who has six years of major league service and, you know, I'm, I'm still getting my innings. And in, so just being around that group and being grateful was certainly where my mind was at um, to start this year. So side note, Adam Conley was the very first guest on this podcast in March of 2017 and I'm guessing if you spent any time with Adam, that should not surprise you uh, because he loves Jesus. And I know his story. I don't know if he ever told you the story of Jose uh, Fernandez's death. Did he ever tell you that story? Um, Playing we, with did him not with go into, we did not go into detail, but I was actually a bit of a Marlins fan at that time. Okay. So. Yeah. I mean, it's a good one. I'll send you the the link to the interview. And it was, again, the, the audio is not as good. I certainly had no idea what I was doing, trying to interview people for this show, but uh, it was a fascinating conversation for a guy who was in a locker room and saw a moment to be able to stand up for his, you know, and help encourage people in the faith in a time of tragedy. So I'll send that over to you. That was episode one. It's kind of funny to, I don't even know what episode we're up to now. It's in the seven hundreds, but it's been a lot of episodes in the last four and a half years. Tyler Zombro, um, your story has an interesting twist, obviously, on June 3rd. Um, that's the day that the accident happens. Can you kind of take me through that day and what you do remember about that day? Because I know there are moments uh, that take place that you don't remember, and you're kind of sharing with me based upon what other people have shared to you. Yeah, so I 
I can remember uh, my best friend from back home was actually in town. Uh, I remember it being, uh, I believe it was a Thursday, a rainy day because we were in a rain delay. Uh, the reason I know that is I likely wasn't going to pitch that night. So I took my, my laptop to the field if I needed to do some work related stuff while we were in a delay. Mm. Um, and from there, you know, I just remember that when the game started, um, my memory cuts off around probably like the fourth ish inning. Um, I remember Nappy telling me that I likely was going to throw that night. We ran into some trouble early in the game on the mound, uh, high pitch count. So it was a scenario where I likely was going to be needed. Uh, and that's, that's about all I can remember beforehand. The next time you have a memory after that, what is it? And then we'll kind of fill in the blanks of everything that happened. So the, it's crazy. I don't, again, the brain is a super powerful thing. Um, right. And I know I was certainly heavily sedated. Um, I can vaguely remember being shifted out of the ICU to a regular hospital room. Um, and then really the, the moments that I do remember is just seeing my wife and my mom and my dad in the hospital room um, and then starting to tell me what happened. So I could fill in the blanks. How far after um, the accident that you're getting your memory back, how, how long after that is that, is that a day, uh, a couple hours? Um, like how long is that? Uh, it was, you know? I was transferred from the ICU to a regular hospital bed on the seventh or eighth. So it would so have been four like four or five days later. Yes. It, it was a few days for sure. Wow. Okay. So well, let's fill in the blanks. People who don't know the story are probably like, how can you do that, Romano? You're supposed to fill in the blanks there and let people know the whole story. Well, you're up to, you're at the mound and you're facing uh, Brent Cumberland of the Norfolk Tides. You're on the Durham Bulls in a AAA game and it's a comebacker. And I remember talking to Paul Mahalam recently. He was a longtime baseball player, a pitcher in the major leagues. And he took a shot. I think it was AA or AAA in the minor leagues that came back a comebacker that didn't have the uh, impact that it had on your, your, um, and what happened to you, but he was, uh, very vivid in sharing the story and just kind of knew that that's part of the game. When you're a pitcher, sometimes comebackers are going to come at you. Um, but this was a little different for you. Can you kind of tell our audience what took place? Yeah. So, uh, obviously I don't remember, I can tell you about a lot of the nature of the injury, but, right. um, uh, a comebacker line drive came back. Um, of course, when you finish a pitch, generally, if you're a right-handed thrower, your right side of your head is exposed to the hitter just with how you finish. Right. Um, so the ball struck me as uh, near the frontal lobe, but you know, on the side of my head here, hmm. um, you know, I guess thankfully slash non thankfully, um, I mean, my skull did, did what it's supposed to do. Unfortunately, it was a thin part of the skull. Um, so I had a fracture there, um, resulted in 16 plates and 32 screws. Hmm. So I'm full of titanium now. Um, but, you know, I think that the scary part of it was also, uh, I had an epidural hematoma. So I had an artery somewhere in there in terms of going to the brain that was clipped. Um, and at that point, obviously you don't want that bleeding to get on the brain or compress it or however it responds uh, you don't want that tissue to be damaged. So I think that was probably the scariest part for all people involved. I know looking at it from a third person view on myself now, that would be my concern is the brain bleeding aspect. Yeah. Um, so was rushed over to Duke hospital, um, Thankfully, I can't say it enough. My trainers and the EMT staff here uh, did an incredible job. I, I look back and, you know, if it if I was in Princeton, West Virginia and rookie ball and this happened, like, I, I don't know if I'm alive. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, that's just the nature of it. Like when that when that bleeding starts near the brain, you you have to get in there and do something. Um, so, again, super thankful to them. You know, they had me to Duke and a CT scan, getting ready to go into surgery within like 30 to 40 minutes, which was incredible, um, especially hearing like the diversity of injuries that happen within the organization and sometimes how long it takes to get somebody to the hospital or, you know, wherever. So 
I'm super thankful for that. Dr. Cook, the neurologist here at Duke, um, went in for the surgery, relieved the bleeding, put that titanium in, and then the recovery started. Mm, wow. Have you ever been hit by a comebacker before? I have to imagine as a pitcher, you've been hit many times, right? Um, I've or a been, few times at least. Yeah, I've, well, I'm a ground ball pitcher. So, okay. um, you know, like I'm getting 60 to 65% ground balls and I've taken quite a few little, you know, skitters off the shins, but, um, you know, nothing higher than that. So, hmm. you know, while, while it is a part of the game, it's something obviously you don't really think about. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing other than the shins. As you start to come to and have some memories and realize the severity of the injury. Um, and I know your wife, Mariah is, is how you pronounce her name, Mariah, right? Yes. She is a huge part of all this as a registered nurse by trade and was able to actually help take care of you in this recovery. Um, but when did you realize, I mean, as you come to, to it and you start having a memory again, um, the severity of the injury and knowing that, wow, this was really, really serious. This wasn't just, oh, I go into surgery and come out and everything's fine. Like there was a lot going on with your recovery that you had to go through in the severity of the injury. Did you, did you even, I don't know, recognize that or realize that as you're sitting in a hospital, obviously you're sitting in a hospital. So you realize, oh, something's not right, but are you recognizing the severity of, of what took place? Yeah. Um, I mean, perspective hit me very quickly. You know, yeah. the first thing that came to mind was, you know, I see my wife, I can recollect memories with her. I see my parents, I know who they are. Um, when Dr. Cook came in to explain to me a little bit about what had happened, um, cause you know, with on the neurology side, they're coming in every couple hours to do checks on me, um, sure. especially making sure that there's no, um, stroke or, seizure, whatever might be happening at that point in time in relation to the brain. And, yeah. uh, you know, he said, here's, here's the graphics. Um, you know, here are the areas that are affected in the brain. And at that point, you know, he's showing me the diagram and it's heavily around the uh, speech cortex and motor cortex. So motor being on the left side of my body. Um, and then of course, speech overall functioning and my speech was, bad. Um, like, like I could get a word or two out, uh, that progressively of course got better and better, but yeah, you know, at that point in time, the left side of my body was numb, but I'm just thinking, okay, well, if I do have brain damage being a pre-med pre PT student, I know the brain tissue doesn't grow back. Right. So I'm like, all right, well, I, you know, I need to kind of figure out here what brain function I do have, what I don't have. And I think in those moments, knowing I could get a word or two out that my speech was still there and my thought was there. I could recollect memories. Honestly, at that point, I'm like, well, I have that. And that's kind of all I need. So any thoughts of getting on the field were completely out of the window in those moments. Tell me about God, faith, life, things like that, like really deeper meaning kind of things, especially your faith in the Lord is that playing a role at all or coming to mind kind of this mortality and eternity and your, your relationship and all these things that had got, kind of been implanted in you from an early age, all the way back with wimp, right. And the example he set, um, what's coming to mind from a spiritual perspective for you as you're recovering and especially in the initial stages of just being thankful, uh, that you're alive. Yeah, I think, um, a lot of thought that went through my mind in relation to this was again, just my, my perspective in the game of baseball and with what I do outside of it. And I think, you know, this is a message that I believe it was pieced in the article. And I know a couple individuals from George Mason really highlighted this, like, like baseball is, I guess my profession now as a job, but it, it's just a sliver of who I am. I think right. it's created an avenue for me to impact lives in a meaningful way. And ultimately with that being a calling for me, if I got on the field or I did not, I knew that I was going to be able to kind of serve that mission. So um, those, those were the moments of, you know, real clarity for me, because when I came home a week after, I guess a week and a half, maybe, um, our team, 
our head of HR, Vince Lodato, is here. He, of course, was with the team during the injury. He's extremely helpful. Um, and, you know, he's talking with me and he's like, have you had any instances of, you know, like, why me or are you angry? And, and those moments of just like, well, I, I know that my bigger mission here is my ability to think and my ability to speak and talk with others and have an impact. So hmm. from that standpoint, like, no, I haven't had any of those thoughts. And he's like, seriously, like, you're not angry. And I'm like, you know, again, no, like, I, I just don't think that my actual playing career itself is a huge, huge part of who I am. I, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't have the ability like Clayton Kershaw to positively impact the world with a $300 million contract. Sure. Like that's just not the element that I'm placed in. So I think that perspective certainly hit. And, you know, I, I hate that this transpired after. Um, and I think there's no such thing as a coincidence, but one of my very close teammates here, uh, Brett Sullivan, his uncle, Rick Knapp, or excuse me, Greg Knapp, Rick Knapp's my pitching coach, but Greg Knapp, the coach with the Jets that passed. Yeah, that's right. Um, so that's Sully's uncle. And, you know, when he had that bike injury, um, one of the things that they were concerned about right away was the, the brain issues. So like I'm seeing scans and they're talking about, you know, and in those scans, you have white areas that are tissue damage. And, you know, it's like, well, what abilities, what do you have? Of course, you know, his life was in jeopardy you know, unfortunately he passed away. And like, for me, I'm just sitting there thinking about it. I met uh, Greg at Sully's wedding this past off season. Hmm. And I'm like, well, I, I can't help but compare myself to him because he was a guy who played at Sacramento state was on some NFL practice squads, got into coaching. And I mean, impacted, I don't know how many people through coaching, like the jets brought him on just to try to, you know, get Zach Wilson to be a really good NFL quarterback. And that's right. Um, he had, you know, he had Steve young, he had Payne Manning in Denver, obviously Matt Ryan in Atlanta, Mike Vick in Atlanta, like all these great quarterbacks he's had an impact on and it wasn't physical. So just that side of knowing the speech and the thinking is the greater importance of who I am that that helped me a ton in terms of knowing where I'm at with the injury. Did it help to run towards God as opposed to running away from him in, in the sense of accepting, like you said, you weren't angry. Uh, Cause I think a lot of people who go through difficult seasons of life and things happening to them or happening for them in, in terms of the, the way that you look at it, uh, allow themselves to be angry with God, but not to run away from him, but to run towards him. Yes, I'm angry with you that this happened, but I still trust in you. What was that like for you? Was that still, was that kind of a similarity? Like I still trust, even though uh, I'm not happy that this thing had happened to me. Yeah, I think in that moment, it's all trust. So knowing the greater picture of who I am and how I can impact lives, I you know, I told Tanya at one point, like there's a, there's a very close friend of mine who has fought many battles through his life um, with his mom passing at a young age. Um, his dad, not really being heavily involved in the picture. He takes elite care of his family. He's one of the best human beings I've ever met. And for me working with him on the training side, and him getting a pretty good contract to take care of himself and his family. Like those things mean more to me than closing out any game, you know, and just moving, moving towards God and knowing the direction that he's put me in life. Um, I, again, I can't do anything but trust. I've had way too many moments of self doubt and frustration um, that I go searching for answers and, I find that things always seem to work themselves out. Uh, so there's no reason for me not to continue to believe in that picture. Uh, so that's, that's where I was in those moments. What's interesting is that piece that ESPN did, you mentioned Tanya, she was the producer on the ESPN piece that released in late August of 2021, which is how we connected. And I saw the piece and was moved by it and just kind of tweeted about it. And Tanya was like, wait, you got to talk to Tyler if you're interested. And I was like, yes. And then suddenly you and I were connected, uh, which is a wonderful world of social media. But when I saw that piece, um, it made me think how, how short the time span was. Like we're talking now and it's the fall, but this only just happened 
in early June. So this isn't that long ago. This isn't like three years of retrospect to go back and look at this story. When Tanya and the ESPN guys approached you, were you ready? Is that, is that the point where you were said, okay, I'm ready to kind of talk about this and share this story? Because I think there comes a point where you're still in the rehab portion of what you're going through and maybe not fully prepared to talk about everything that took place. What was that like when you were approached by them? Because you know, as well as I do, I ha happened to work there for a long time. Once something is on ESPN, everybody's watching it, everybody's reading it, and a lot of people who may not have known about your story are suddenly going to hear about it. I will say that they did a phenomenal job of working with me because I had a very strict outline in terms of what could and could not be shown, what questions should and should not be asked. Um, there, there was a moment where, uh, again, going back to our team, Vince Lodato's in town and we're talking and, you know, I didn't want my teammates to see me right away. I looked terrible. I don't care for them to see the staples in my head. And sure. at that point, like I hadn't eaten or drank hardly anything. Yeah. Um, but I knew when I could start filling in the blanks that I wanted to do so simply because if, you know, if, if the story's out there, you know, has major brain surgery, has brain bleeding, has a skull fracture that involves 48 titanium objects. He's going to speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy. Like your, your mind can go a million different places with that. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, to, to have the story also talking about the bigger picture of who I am and the positive side of recovery is where I wanted to focus. Um, you know, a, a lot of people wanted to harp on the video and should pictures wear headgear, but that's, that's not the bigger picture for me. Um, if I can have an impact by getting, you know, some sort of carbon fiber put in on a pitcher's dominant side and that helps surely, but I really wanted to focus on the positive side of the recovery. Um, you know, again, how much my wife has helped me with it, the community that I have here around me showing people that we're getting back into the swing of things. And ultimately I'm, I'm still able to move where, where I'm meant to end life from here. What was the reaction like when the piece came out from not just your inner circle, but the people who've never heard of you or didn't know your story? I have to imagine you got lots of messages and lots of feedback from a ton of people. I did. Um, you know, the crazy thing is even just like after surgery, I, I posted a tweet to say, you know, I'm doing well and thank you to everybody for the prayers. And it, it's weird because everybody responds in those moments saying like, hope to see you back out on the field. And, you know, when will you be back out or anything like that? And yeah. And again, like I kind of told you the the speech and the general cognitive function to me was just so much more important than that. And so when, when I saw the piece, um, there were definitely emotions, but honestly, reading Tanya's article, uh, that, that hit me much deeper than the video itself, just to reflect on the journey thus far, what's to come, why I'm in these positions, how I'm going to navigate life moving forward. That, that definitely stuck with me way more than just thinking about the physical side of playing baseball again. Yeah, it's turning, you know, I've heard this it's sort of cliche from the speaking world or even in the church world, but you heard, you hear people say turning your pain into purpose, but that's not cliche for you. That's legitimately what you're going through and recognizing that, yeah, I went through this, but there's a purpose for going through this situation that God has placed me in to now make a difference in so many other people's lives, which is so cool, Tyler, if I'm being honest, because again, we're only a few months removed from everything happening here. So there's still work to be done. Um, I do want to ask about your wife, Mariah, um, what she's meant to you. Obviously you've been with her since your sophomore year of high school, which I don't remember reading. So that's impressive. My brother has been with his now wife of 20 plus years since they were like in ninth grade. Um, I did not meet my wife in high school or even college. So I'm always kind of blown away that you, you're with a high school sweetheart that you've known since you were babies, really. And now you're what, 27 years old. Um, what's Mariah been like these last few months for you as not just a caregiver, but as a wife and a support system for you? I mean, she she's amazing because knowing all sides of me, she knows which areas, um, 
I guess our, she, she sees the bigger picture of like, yes, I want you to get back out on a baseball field, but I also know that you're fine no matter what. And she, she's really good at seeing where my mind is at in relation to those things, because frankly, like we go to our first neurologist appointment and she's the one asking all the questions about returning to the baseball field. And Hmm. again, she's like, I already know you were thinking like, if you don't play again, you're going to be fine, but you know, I'm going to make sure we get all these answers for you. Um, So she knows how to, how to directly navigate with me in terms of my life structure and her support on both ends of that, both in my private sector work and my playing career. It's been amazing. You know, I, I think it's, it definitely speaks to how much she sacrifices to do travel nursing, to uh, travel with me this season. You know, when, when we got married last October, we said we're not going to do any more distance because we went to college apart. Yeah. Um, and just having that commitment from her, you know, that they sacrifice a lot. I give it, I give it up to the wives and girlfriends who travel with guys. And I think that, you know, a lot of times I want to make sure that she's still doing what she wants and what she's called to do. And with her doing radiology here and travel nursing, she still is able to accomplish that. And being able to do that while sacrificing for me speaks to the power of her as a person. Um, but I mean, she was incredible. The the caregiver side, I, I mean, she's seen me at my most vulnerable states now, you know, like, I mean, she has to help me shower, you name it. It, it was obviously difficult for me and I'm sure it was difficult for her at first, but she head on embraced it. And those first few weeks, she, she carried the load. I can only imagine, um, as we record this, I look at you and I don't want to say it kind of slightly, but you look fine. Like you look great. And the conversation never once in talking to you, did I think this was a guy who had to relearn how to speak again, uh, just a few months ago. Um, so how are you health wise? How are you doing, Tyler? You look great. I'm doing well. Um, all cognitive function is back. I'm starting to get into more physical activity. All of that's been great so far. Um, I mean, I can't say enough again about kind of that first three to four week window Mm. where around the tissue damage, there's also a lot of inflammation. So like I can't see any light because I'll have terrible headaches, sound, same type of thing. Um, And of course, you know, having Mariah, I think she really set the table for how I was going to recover. And then of course, my therapies here at Duke have been phenomenal. Um, there's definitely things that I wasn't comfortable with early on. And I, I was certainly angry at times, but, you know, just continued to get better and better. And I'm certainly grateful for that. Um, you know, with, with this injury, there's, there's a lot of things that can't really be explained. Um, if, if you believe, I think there's some explanations, but you know, when I show people, I have a, I have a more detailed rendering of the original scan than what's been posted to the public. And I look at that and I look at the brain damage and I know how the brain works, but just to think that all these things have come back to put me in the spot I'm in now is, is nothing short of remarkable. Yeah. You're like a walking miracle, my friend. That's awesome. Um, you have not real quick, you have not watched the clip and you don't ever want to see it right of you getting hit that's that was in the article i think in the video too that was probably part of your sort of the parameters that you put around the conversation with espn as well but you didn't want that shown and you haven't watched it correct i haven't watched it um obviously when i was in the hospital i could kind of put two and two together um knowing that i was hit i suffered a seizure um because of course, at, at that point in time in my recovery, the repeating seizure was kind of the biggest concern for us. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I have an idea in my head of what kind of happened. Um, I actually, unfortunately, had a really difficult conversation with a local news station probably two weeks after the injury as they contacted me for an interview and wanted to re-air the video. Mm. Um And, you know, I, I think a lot of what's really triggered me with the video is not, not for my perspective, because for me, if I watch it, it'll be fine. I still can't remember the event, you know, um, I've thrown how many thousands of pitches in my life. Like 
I can, I can generally have an idea of like, okay, like there's me pitching and this is probably what that pitch felt like, but I can't remember anything else. Um, but the impact that that would have on my teammates, on my wife, on my parents, on my friends, other family, anybody that supported me in my baseball career, I don't, I don't want that to have an effect on them anymore. And again, that's part of doing the story was to put this in positive light. And, you know, I, again, this situation for me is positive, whether I get back on the field or not. Um, that's right. Ultimately, I think I'm, I'm able to do what I'm meant to do and, and I'm a hundred percent happy and ready to live with that. So that's, that's why I, I really don't want the video aired is more so for them than myself. And December is a big month, right? To know whether this possibility of pitching again, which I know you desire to do, if God wills it, uh, December is a big month for you to kind of know what direction to go in, right? Yeah. So we'll have a repeat scan done in December just to see how is the skull kind of healed up? What I guess, what do the plates and screws look like? And then ultimately I, I just have to get the okay in terms of the headgear that I'll be wearing, um, do they deem it, you know, safe. And on my end, uh, you know, it's going to be a conversation with Dr. Cook and saying, Hey, do you think this is essentially 100% safe compared to where I was? Like, is there absolutely zero risk assumed from where I was at prior to injury? And, you know, he deems that acceptable. Then I plan to pitch again. Well, it would be really cool to see you pitch again. And if not, it's going to be even more cool to watch what God does and takes you on your journey, Tyler. Um, my last question for you, thanks for all the time here and sharing your story. Uh, there's so much more we could talk about, right? And maybe we'll get you on after December at some point next year and see where the Lord brings you to. Um, but right now, as you sit here and you're thinking about the lessons that God has shown you and taught you, and it could be over your life or it could just be in the last few months, but what do you think he's showing and teaching you now? Because God, I think, teaches us all lessons pretty quickly on life. And, and every day, it feels like I learned something new in my relationship with God. What's he showing you and, and teaching you when you think about right now and where you're at? Where you're at? Um, I would say the biggest thing for me is, is letting go and letting him take control. That's, I mean, <laughs> you ask my wife and she'll tell you the same thing because Again, I'm very routine oriented. I have insane control over everything I'm doing every day, every minute. It's kind of planned out. Um, you know, I think and letting him take control, it's it's it allows me to gain that perspective. Um, so like uh, and then again, I I mean I never really even thought about this, but before I get on the mound, the the prayer that I say to myself, and I heard this from Clayton Kershaw. Mm -hmm. was, you know, it's just Lord be with me. Don't help me. Like, I think a lot of people, right. In a sport competition event, it's like, you know, help me get through this outing or help me do well, help me succeed. And it's like, no, because it's just be with me. Um, now you could say with the nature of my injury, I'm certainly grateful that that was the case. Um, but there's just, there's been so many moments in my journey where I have to let go of that control. Um, Going back to Tanya's article, the moments of frustration being undrafted, going on my nightly walks, thinking, pondering, why am I not playing baseball anymore? Yeah. And ultimately, just just letting go of control has has always been the answer for me in terms of trusting that. And I would say that that's, that's the statement, the mission that he's helping me understand. That's good. Tyler Zombro, thanks, man. Thanks for sharing your story. Um, thanks for doing the, the piece with ESPN, uh, obviously, because that re- reaches a lot more people than we do. But thanks for kind of going a little deeper with that with us here at Sports Spectrum. And uh, we'll stay in touch and hopefully we'll have some some news, you know, maybe early next year and see where the Lord brings you. But uh, all the best to you. Thanks for, for sharing your story here on Sports Spectrum. Yeah, thanks for having me. And many thanks to my friend, my new friend, Tyler Zombro, for being here today on Sports Spectrum. Isn't he an inspiration? Just his outlook, his positivity, his recognition that this accident that happened, and I mean, when you go through two and a half hours of emergency brain surgery and then days and days of rehab for occupational therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, cognitive therapy, I mean, that's just going through it. And still being able to trust in God, still being able to be positive, still being able to find that purpose, 
to impact others. That's inspiring to me. I hope it was to you as well. Many thanks to Tyler Zombro for being our guest today on Sports Spectrum. We appreciate you for tuning in as well. Do us a favor. Make sure you click that follow button on the podcast app that you're listening on so that you never miss an episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast. And then share this conversation with someone. Maybe you know someone who's going through a difficult time. Maybe you know someone who's been through a difficult situation and is looking for some inspiration or some encouragement. Maybe you know someone who loves sports and you want to introduce them to Christ That's what we're about here at Sports Spectrum. That's what we want to be known as, a resource to help others in their faith journey. And certainly Tyler Zombro's story is going to encourage everyone that hears it. So consider that. Please share. Please click that follow button and never miss an episode. Make sure you check out our website as well, sportspectrum.com. And then join us next time right here on the show. You can reach me directly via my email address, jason at sportspectrum.com. I'd love to hear from you, jason at sportspectrum.com. And tune in next time right here on Sports Spectrum. Have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon.